the Princess Diokai was born to the last monarch of Korea, King Gojong. Yet, she would later be forced to relocate to Japan by the imperial Japanese authorities who ruled Korea at the time. Then she began suffering from a variety of mental illnesses, which would plague her for the remainder of her life. This is the story of the last princess of Korea. The woman known to history as Princess Diakai was actually not given a name following her birth in the Changdeok Palace in Seoul on the 25th of May, 1912. She was born to the Korean Emperor Gojong and his concubine Yang Gui In, and was treated initially as though she were an illegitimate child. This situation, though, did not last for long, as the girl soon won the affection of her father, and eventually in 1917, at the age of five, she was formally recognized and registered as part of the imperial family as Princess Deokai. The princess had been born into the imperial family and was growing up in the imperial palace during a turbulent period. Since 1392, the Kingdom of Korea had been ruled by the Joseon dynasty. Isolated and cut off for the world for centuries, the kingdom had prospered in its own way. But the 19th century had brought new challenges. The great Western powers of Europe and North America were increasingly expanding their spheres of influence into the Far East and bringing with them new cultures, technologies and systems of government. Beginning in the mid-1850s, Japan had experienced increasing encroachments by the United States, France and Britain, who aggressively forced the country to open up trade to Western influences. Then, from 1870 onwards, Korea became a focus of these attentions. Indeed, once Japan underwent a period of rapid modernization in the 1860s and 1870s, it increasingly had designs on the Korean peninsula. Under the leadership of Queen Min, the consort of the Korean King Gojong in the 1880s and 1890s, the country fiercely resisted Western and Japanese intervention, often by allying with Russia against the Japanese. Yet a series of events in the 1890s and 1900s had worn down Korea and ended its fight to maintain its independence. In 1910, the country was essentially annexed by Japan. King Gojong, who had briefly proclaimed himself Emperor of Korea in the late 1890s, was forced to abdicate, though he was allowed by the Japanese authorities to maintain his position in a largely ceremonial capacity as a kind of Emperor Emeritus. Effectively, then, the royal family, which Princess Deokai had been born into in 1912, was nothing more than a puppet regime. The Empire of Japan was the real power in Korea from 1910 onwards and ruled the country through a government of occupation. The Japanese administration in Seoul and the central Japanese government in Tokyo would shape the course of Princess Diakai's life in more ways than one. Though Gojong had many children, several of these had died at a young age, pushing Diakai up the list of his eldest children. Yet, this created its own difficulties, as it made the Japanese authorities in Korea more likely to interfere in her affairs, particularly so from 1917 onwards, after she was officially registered as a member of the imperial family. In an effort to prevent the Japanese authorities from trying to dictate how her life should proceed, Gojong attempted in 1919 to organize a marriage for his youngest daughter. Prior to this, he had already established the Deoku Palace Kindergarten for Diokai in Jeokjang in order to prevent her from being sent to Japan, as her brothers had already been. Now, a marriage was also planned to cement her ties to Korea. The union which was proposed was with Kam Jang Han, a nephew of one of the senior court chamberlains in Seoul, Kim Hua Jing. However, Owing to the objections of the Japanese authorities in Seoul, the marriage was blocked. Then, Gujong's sudden death just days later, on the 21st of January 1919, ensured that no further organized marriages would be attempted in Korea for the princess. Gujong had not been ill at the time, and there was speculation 
that he had been poisoned by the Japanese authorities in Seoul, plausibly owing to his secretive efforts to marry his daughter to a Korean dignitary. This theory has never been discredited and is possible that it was how in fact he met his end. Now, with her father dead, the princess was effectively a ward of the Japanese government of occupation in Seoul. Though her mother was alive, for the time being, her life continued with a degree of normality, and she was sent to attend the Hinodai school in the Korean capital. But her life would soon take a drastic turn in the mid-1920s. In 1925, as part of the Japanese government's policy of attempting to scupper any possibility of rebellion in Korea, Diakai was removed from her homeland and sent to Japan itself. She was just 13 years old at the time. While living here in the late 1920s, she attended the Gakushuin School in Tokyo, which had been established as a vocational school in 1923. There she learned sewing and cultural education. Many of the details of her life while in Japan are largely obscure. We know that she was allowed to briefly return to Korea early in 1930 to attend her mother's funeral. It is around this time that her mental health difficulties can first be traced. Having returned to Japan, it is recorded that she began to sleepwalk while her behavior became more erratic in the months that followed. Eventually, she would be diagnosed with what is called precocious dementia in the early 20th century. This is a disused medical term which was generally applied at the time to any type of deteriorating psychotic disorder. A more appropriate assessment of Diakai's condition today would conclude that she was suffering from schizophrenia, characterized by frequent or periodic episodes of psychosis. Despite her increasing difficulties, the Japanese government was determined to marry her to a Japanese husband once she reached an appropriate age and her condition had stabilized enough for the wedding to take place. Accordingly, in the course of the 1930s, the Japanese emperor Taisho concluded that Diakai would marry Count So Takeyuki, a member of a Japanese middling noble family. The So clan, from which he hailed, had ruled the island of Tsushima off the western coast of Japan's central and largest island, Honshu, for several centuries, prior to the reorganization of Japan's society in the 1860s and 70s. There was a specific reason, and it is because with their position on the western extremity of the Japanese archipelago and proximity to the Korean peninsula, it had played a role in the Japanese-Korean relations for centuries. Now the daughter of the last king of Korea would be married to the head of that same clan. The wedding was to take place on Tsushima Island on the 8th of May 1931. Thereafter, Diakai's condition worsened. This was not the fault of her husband. By all accounts, he was a considerate husband and indeed the young couple quickly welcomed a child when their daughter, named Maise, in Japanese, was born on the 14th of August, 1932. Nevertheless, by the following year, Diakai's condition was declining sharply, and in the course of 1933, she was admitted to a mental hospital for the first time. She would spend years here, intermittently, throughout the lead up and course of the Second World War. We know little of her life during these times, which is unsurprising given the secretive nature of addressing mental health disorders in any society in the first half of the 20th century. She would have been supported by her husband, an individual who was often represented in an unfavorable light, but who was clearly not the villain of the story. He, like her, had been forced into the marriage and had to grapple with family financial problems as well as his wife's condition throughout the war years and the difficult period that followed. Nevertheless, he must have held some affection towards her, as there are poems extant by him which are dedicated to his wife and daughter. Despite his best efforts, the union could not be sustained, particularly once the war had ended and the imperial government, which had coerced them into marrying each other in 1931, ceased to exist. Additionally, Korea had reached its independence in the aftermath of the war. As a result, the couple divorced in 1953. The greatest tragedy they faced, however, 
followed three years later, when their daughter fled their home, leaving behind a note which read like a suicide note. She was never seen again, and it is assumed that she took her own life. In the aftermath of this traumatic development, Dear Kai's condition deteriorated further. The former princess might well have spent her last years simply forgotten about in a Japanese asylum, but for the intervention of certain parties in Korea on her behalf. In the aftermath of the Korean War, fought between 1950 and 53, the country had been divided in two, North Korea with the communist Soviet Russia bloc and South Korea with the capitalist bloc led by the US. However, while North Korea is generally famed for its brutal dictatorship, South Korea also flirted for many years with authoritarianism, particularly under the long rule of Siang Man Ri from 1948 to 1960. Under such conditions, there was inherent suspicion of the old royal family and Dear Kai's return to Korea was opposed. But in the early 1960s, circumstances became more proprietous and in 1962, Princess Dorokai was given permission to return to her homeland. She wept when she saw the Korean mainland for the first time in 32 years. The princess spent the remainder of her life residing at her childhood home in Chandeok Palace in Seoul, which had been re-established as a residence for the surviving members of the Joseon dynasty. Here, she and her sister-in-law, Yi Bangja, along with her half-nephew and grandson of Gojong and the theoretical last head of the Jison dynasty, lived with a stripend from the Korean government. However, even then, Dear Kai's troubles did not subside. She was periodically admitted to Seoul National University Hospital for assistance with her psychiatric disorders in the years following her return to Korea. And yet she lived for nearly three decades when she eventually died on the 21st of April 1989, she was apparently suffering from asphasia, a condition which results from brain damage and which robs the sufferer of the ability to understand language, meaning she couldn't speak to others or understand what was said to her. She had outlived all of her half-brothers and half-sisters by that time. But it was a difficult life, one which was compromised early on by the political circumstances into which she was born, the trauma of which she seemed never to fully recover from. Today, a monument stands on Tsushima Island, commemorating her marriage to her husband, Count So, in 1931. Dear Kai's life has been the subject of a number of books, plays and films, the most celebrated being The Last Princess, a Korean film which was released to critical acclaim in 2016, and which is concerned with her life in Japan and her efforts to return to Korea. Thank you for watching. Today's episode was narrated by Mortis Media, and if you're interested in scary stories, there'll probably be a link somewhere in the description for further listening. But for now, stay safe, and see you for the next Forgotten Lives.